This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library Main Branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Razib with the uh, Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And uh, I am here today with Peter Nemitz. Um, I'm not going to say friend because I don't know Peter uh, except through the internet. And we've only had a few, a few discussions here and there. Uh, but um, you know, he has a great Substack, Nemitz.substack.com, and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna like come out and say it. Um, Peter is, you know, someone who has a life that's totally unrelated to the internet, and so I'm not gonna give the whole, this is where he works and all that stuff. Okay, uh, we're just gonna go. We're gonna focus on the content. Uh, that's why he's here. He's here because of the Substack. He's here because of Post. He's here because of his Twitter. Um, and uh, you know, we're gonna focus on on the content, and that's that's how we're gonna go. So, Peter, um, you know, let's let's like dig into it. Uh, you know, you wrote a post, uh, a, a very very long post, uh, a survey basically called uh, Seven Ages of Western Eurasia: A Brief Outline of the." Uh, eleven thousand seven hundred years from the Anatolian farmers to the present. Now, I, as a preface, I do want to say, um, you know, uh, my editor for my text pieces uh, quite often is annoyed that I keep referring to the end of the ice age like everybody would know when that is. Uh, well, it is eleven thousand seven hundred years. I've been more explicit recently uh, about that date. Uh, I hope some of you appreciate it and recognize it. Um, but yeah, so that's why that date is there. Um, and so let's start with that date. Um, and why don't you go through quickly um, on the ages, give people a preview, and then we'll loop back, Peter, and just like dig. How's that? Sure. Sounds good. Um, so first, you know, if the Ice Age goes on for hundreds of thousands of years, has some uh, interglacials, like the Emian, I think, was like 140,000, the 100, like 20,000 years ago. Um, you know, some stuff probably happened in those inter interglacials, but humanity hadn't really uh, evolved to uh, take off like it did uh, within the last one. Um, so the Ice Age uh, ended, I think, actually around um, 12,000 BC. And there's like this, uh, a little over a thousand year long period, you know, this brief interglacial where it looks like civilization actually starts to take off, uh, not just in Western Eurasia, but elsewhere too. There's uh, some finds in the Horton Plains of uh, central Sri Lanka um, that show like kind of intensive cereal harvesting, which may be agriculture, may not be. Um, but anyhow, right around, uh, I think it's about 10,800 BC, um, there is this, uh, what's called the Younger Dryas event. So like this thousand years, there's this return to ice age conditions and that civilization or like proto-civilization in Sri Lanka as well as possible other proto-civilizations, uh, you know, they largely die off in that period. The exception is this kind of like pre-civilization, the Natufians in the Levant. Um, the Levant, you know, that's like Syria, Israel, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and that's kind of like spared you know, it, it still gets kind of colder, but they're still able to kind of harvest those grains. They don't, um, like their range is still large enough. They don't completely revert to a total hunting and gathering like the rest of the world had to. Uh, so there's kind of like that proto-civilization. And it, it's only like really until after the end of the Younger Dryas that you see kind of the permanent revival of agriculture. And that's across kind of the whole Fertile Crescent. So not just the Levant, but also like Mesopotamia, parts of uh, Iran and Anatolia. And you see uh, people that are exploiting all these different kind of, uh, you know, wild cereals. Um, and they're both, you know, deliberately as well as accidentally choosing the ones that uh, work with them the best. Like, uh, you know, a lot of cereal grains in the wilds, they 
you know, they shadow their seeds just naturally. It's, uh, you know, it's called a rachis or rachis. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, and it causes these like nutrient calorie uh, rich seeds to go like shatter and they go like flying around to kind of spread that uh, plant um, around. So humans, you know, we don't want that to happen. We want the ratchets to stay strong. So we're picking like the, you know, uh, plants with the hardest ratchets to, uh, you know, kind of harvest. Uh, so there's a lot of different, like the groups, no one really takes off in this first stage from like 9,700 to 8,300 BC. It just, everyone's kind of experimenting with agriculture. They're trying a bunch of different plants and, um, you know, there's not really domesticated animals involved. Uh, around 8,300 BC, there's uh, what's called a bond event. You know, they happen every maybe like 1,000 to 2,000 years roughly. And for whatever reason, during these bond events, like everything gets cold and tons of people die off. You know, you have famines and when there's famines, uh, you know, the chieftain, you know, the lord, king, priest, whatever, uh, they, you know, all of a sudden they can't maintain their authority since, you know, their authority, a lot of it has to do with, you um, you know, kind of being able to somewhat understand uh, reality as it is. Uh, you know, these first age people, they did have, like, they did understand astronomy. They actually built, like, uh, you know, they clearly had some form of calendar. Uh, like, there's this site, Jericho, uh, which has various, like, astronomical um, stuff on it. And that's, like, very common. Like, even the most primitive sedentary societies, like, they almost immediately within like a century or two, uh, start building, you know, things that can tell like when the solstice is going to be. Uh, like I know the American Southwest, if you go down to Casa Grande, uh, which is kind of near Tucson, like about an hour or two drives south of uh, Phoenix, um, you know, fairly primitive society and yet like, you know, very marginal existence in a very harsh climate. And yet what did they do? They built this giant uh, structure where, you know, they could tell uh, when the solstice was going to happen with it. Um, so these, these people aren't dumb by any means. It's just, it's very, uh, you know, the crops aren't as good as they became and they didn't have domesticated animals. So they're still like, you know, it's a hard life. Uh, so 8300 BC, you know, everything kind of, uh, collapses except again, the Southern Levant, which is kind of spared just an extremely good climate. Um, you know, it's probably why the Palestinians and Israelis, uh, you know, fight each other so much for it even today. Um, but kind of during that, uh, you know, colder climate, you start to see in a lot of other places, there's a shift towards uh, animal domestication, not so much in the Southern Levant, uh, but definitely in like Anatolia, um, as well as in kind of like Western Iran and the Zagros Mountains, um, and kind of like the very Northern parts of the Levant and uh, upper Mesopotamia, you know, people are messing around with uh, cattle um, and, uh, you know, sheep, goats, that kind of thing. And it's a very different, you know, lifestyle. Uh, you know, they were more sedentary than kind of the wandering hunter-gatherers. Um, and this is kind of the second age, by the way. This is like 8300 uh, BC to 6200 BC. Um, and it creates kind of these new societies. You know, they're pastoral. So you have to build, like the way that they're developing is not so much like, you know, a priest who has to tell the seasons and be able to predict like, oh, uh, you know, this is when you sow the crops. This is when you harvest the crops. Otherwise, everyone's going to starve to death the next year. Um, it's a lot more like, you know, there's like raiding involved, uh, like Gebekli Tepe, which is earlier than the, it was kind of a first age site. You know, it's this intensely like patriarchal, violent society since uh, animal raiding was presumably such a hard part of it. And we don't have any like archaeological uh, evidence of kind of this intense raiding other than the, you know, a bunch of these bones from that era, uh, you know, clearly show evidence of violence. Um, and then we have kind of comparable, uh, you know, anthropological research in the last couple decades, which shows, you know, hey, pastoralism. Um, when you're hurting these animals, you know, a lot of the uh, conflict is going to come from, you know, people fighting for control of these animals. Uh, so by like the 7000s, you have this synthesis, you start seeing like the mixture of crops as well as animals. Um, you know, so there's like a lot of churn, but nonetheless, like they were still pretty xenophobic societies. Like they weren't really mixing that much with their uh, their neighbors. Like the people in the Zagros Mountains are very distinct. The people in Anatolia are very distinct. And then the people in kind of the Southern Levant area are uh, very distinct. 
And that doesn't really change until kind of the mid to late um, seventh millennium, like the 6,000 BCs, uh, when you do start seeing like a lot of mixing in the South Caucasus region, uh, especially. Um, so that second age, it ends, there's this like absolutely massive cataclysm around 6,200 BC. Uh, there's all these floods in the Pacific Northwest here in America. Uh, there's the uh, Storega slides for a good part of the continental shelf off the coast of Norway collapses. And there's like all these, you know, probably three tsunamis, uh, I think is the current belief, um, you know, that kind of deluge the whole eastern coast of Britain. I think like even in the highlands, you can find like seashells from that layer, like right around 6200 BC. Um, the Doggerland Land Bridge, which was more of an like archipelago uh, at the time than a true like land bridge by 6200 BC, uh, was kind of drowned in that period, presumably wiping out like everyone who lived there. Uh, and the Danube River, that's kind of like, you know, where Bulgaria and Romania, like their border up to, uh, you know, through Serbia, Hungary and in, into Austria. Uh, there were a bunch of floods there, which devastated the hunter gatherers. Um, so just, you know, all these cataclysms going on in 6200 BC, uh, and it kind of like opens the way to, you know, the expansion of these, uh, you know, farmers from the Middle East. Uh, so the Anatolian farmers, uh, you know, they do have like cows and, you know, domesticated animals by that point. They move in, uh, they reach Portugal by 5600 BC in Germany, I think right around the same time. Uh, but their kind of like ecological range is very restrictive. They focus on settling in uh, areas with lowest soils, which were very uh, fertile. Uh, you know, meanwhile, in um, the east, you have, you know, like the uh, farmers from the Zagros who have mixed in, you know, somewhat with the uh, farmers from Anatolia. You know, they're pushing into like the southern Caspian, which was previously inhabited by gazelle and um, seal hunters. Uh, you know, I think there's some contacts in the 5000s uh, between uh, the agricultural Jaytun uh, society and they're in kind of like modern day Turkmenistan with eastern Iran. Uh, you know, they go and uh, you would know the genetics better than I would, but there's clearly like some sort of uh, cultural technological exchange between them and the people of the Indus Valley. Uh, wasn't there a genetic exchange too, or was it just like trade? Wait. What date are you talking about? Uh, this would be like the 5000s with the Jaytun culture and like the very beginning of Mergar. Okay, uh, so Jaytun, like, where are they from originally is the highest pops? They're from like, you know, Horasan, basically, northeastern Iran, like southwestern Turkmenistan. Yeah, yeah so what I would say to that is uh, there looks to be an insertion or like admixture of a minority Siberian component at around that time. It's definitely before the the step Indo-Aryans came um, enrichment into the Indus Valley, and that was probably mediated, I think, through a mixed population. So that could be a signal of that because there was consistent movement of uh, ancestral North Eurasian, like let's say from the Altai region and kind of Kazakhstan southward along the uh, um, the uh, the fringe. Uh, in you know yeah, the Pamirs in that area, uh, it looks like probably where there's like more precipitation at the mid out mid latitudes. There's people always going north and south. It seems so. I think that's what you're what you're alluding to there. Yeah, I think um, like the Jokesior site. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Um, I think maybe in like the three thousands or two thousands. I think it's in that big uh, you know South Central Asia genetic mm -hmm. paper a couple of years ago, you know, and they found yeah. that kind of like ancestral North Eurasian rich uh, component uh, within yeah. that kind of like Southeastern Caspian region. Um, mm -hmm. So that makes sense then if it, uh, you know, that kind of mixed in with these farmers migrating from, uh, you know, the Zagros and then, you know, they mixed with the Eastern Caspian people and then, you know, they pushed into uh, the Indus from there. Yeah. Yeah. And just to be clear, cause like uh, I have, uh, you know, listeners who are quite who are going to get if i don't like clarify here it does look like now to the best of our knowledge that the dominant iranian component in the indus valley civilization split off from the zagros farmers during the pleistocene probably well after the last glacial maximum but before the end of the pleistocene uh, eleven thousand seven hundred years ago 
And so, you know, their dominant component is not actually Zagros farmer proper, but probably a related population that was probably occupying Afghanistan, perhaps the fringe of Pakistan, uh, the whole area around the Pamirs, just, just to be clear. Yeah, there's some, uh, you know, I, I think it's like the Tudakalian complex of Tajikistan, you know, and I think that's the current belief for that kind of like Zagrosian-like population that migrated to Central Asia during the uh, Pleistocene. All right, so I, and I got to be clear for you and for the listeners. Um, I am recognizing some of these archaeological complexes, but a lot of them are Greek to me. So just bear with me. I mean, they're Greek to me too. I just kind of like read the literature and try to make sense of it. Um, so a lot going on in like the 5000s, uh, you know, you see these uh, farm, you know, this kind of synthesis of the farmers and the herders, you know, they're expanding into Central Asia, have some influence in the Indus Valley, you know, they overrun a good chunk of Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, when you start getting into the 4000s, um, you actually start seeing like some movement into Northwestern Africa too. Um, the cardio wear people, they, uh, you know, I mean, do you want me to go into the, this is kind of like a long tangent that doesn't really have that much to do with the thesis, but there's kind yeah, of like, why, a, don't, why don't you just move, move past that? Because we'll, we'll loop back. Okay. We can dig, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I think how we should do this. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, third age you've, or this, you know, second age, you've got this, uh, or we went over the second fall, you know, the floods and everything. So third age, 6200 BC to 4400 BC, um, you know, the farmer herder synthesis expands everywhere. You know, people have goats, they have pigs. Uh, it was presumably devastating to a lot of the uh, hunter gatherers everywhere. You know, pigs and cows, they carry all sorts of nasty diseases like, uh, you know, cows, for instance. Uh, can carry tuberculosis and you know i think the earliest tuberculosis find is from like a second age uh site like you know uh, 82 8, bc roughly i think in uh, northern mesopotamia um so i think a lot of the reasons for why it was specifically this you know second age synthesis of uh you know animal domestication of farmers that took over in the third age was because they had uh, resistance to a lot of these diseases carried by domestic animals that the uh you know hunter gatherers that they encountered in the uh, third age didn't necessarily have um third age we also see kind of the rise of like irrigation there's a lot more uh, mixing at least in the middle east uh so you know some signs of like cosmopolitanism the kind of like extreme xenophobia, racism, whatever you want to call it, that featured like the first and second age. Uh, you know, it still exists, but it's not like to the same extent. Um, like we have, you know, there's records in the Americas, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of the peoples, they only, you know, they're only concepts for, uh, you know, they would call themselves like the humans or the speakers. And then, you know, all of their uh, neighbors would be known as like the enemies or the animals or something like that. And that kind of happens in like Europe too, like, uh, you know, even in medieval Russia, um, the Russians called their neighbors, like the mutes, the strange ones, um, you know, the, the Nimtsi, the, Chud, the, the Chudsi, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not like something that's totally alien, uh, but there starts to be like some kind of cosmopolitanism uh, within the third age. I start to see like a lot more fortifications, um, you know, which is, you know, chiefdoms that kind of thing more than just uh you know roving uh bands of uh you know kind of there's definitely a lot of like endemic warfare once the farmers had kind of like taken over the ecologies that they could exploit uh, they contested those very fiercely especially after 5000 bc uh, once they populated them a lot of the population stuff happened like very very rapidly i think uh, you know, their populations in a lot of places were probably doubling every like 20 to, you know, 25 years or so. Uh, so, you know, after eight generations, they could just take over an area uh, if there weren't hunter gatherers there. Um, the third fall is kind of mysterious. It's around 4400 BC, at least in Europe. I'm not, I'm not as familiar with uh, India and the Middle East around 4400 BC. Uh, but in Europe, like, it's clear that something absolutely massive happened since you see, like, the downfall of all of these, like, farmer societies and their conquest by the hunter-gatherers. And it seems to be, like, specifically their neighboring hunter-gatherers that take them over. Uh, like, you know, it pops up in Ukraine, Poland, Germany, uh, kind of like the low countries as well as Iberia. 
Uh, and it looks like these basically everywhere except for Croatia, which was like the one place where the uh, farmers kind of held up. Uh, but what I think happened there for this, uh, you know, this third fall around 4400 BC was uh, you start to see like right around 4600, 4500 BC is the spread of like copper working, copper mining, that kind of thing. And it's in these locations in like the Carpathians and Hungary and Austria, uh, which were kind of like not um, in the farmer realm. You know, it's like up in the mountains. So you have like these hunter gatherers. And I think what was happening is the hunter gatherers had access to the metal. They became like the wealthy and powerful ones. And then, uh, you know, that kind of broke the old order of the, uh, the farmers and they managed to uh, conquer the farmers. And they created like this hunter gatherer uh, farmer synthesis, which was a lot better than either like the farmer culture and the hunter gatherer uh, culture. So as a result, like after that, like horrible event where, you know, obviously tons of people were killed and raped because um, you know the y chromosomes of the uh you know successor peoples end up being like in iberia something like 80 percent a hunter gatherer even though they were only like 15 to 20 percent of the autosomal uh, ancestry um you know but the synthesis like definitely takes off the parts of europe that you know like uh, southern scandinavia britain um you know, kind of like the areas not around the low S soil start to be taken over uh, by these new, like this hunter gatherer and uh, farmer synthesis. Um, this is also when, you know, I think something similar happened in the South Caucasus too. Uh, you see these hunter gatherer cultures, which had survived all the way into like, you know, the fifth millennium BC, uh, coexisting with farmers for, you know, thousands of years in some cases, and all of a sudden, like their signs of their existence disappear, and you start seeing like major fortified sites. So, uh, you know, there's kind of like state, uh, kind of like state structures that are starting to be built. Um, you know, I know for like the Neolithic France stuff around like 4000 BC, there, you know, they couldn't really, if you look at like the PCA, there's not that much difference between like the people of Southern France like in the Pyrenees and the people in kind of like the Paris Basin, which I think along with kind of evidence of large scale colonization of Britain uh, around the same time um, from, you know, the same people shows there was some, you know, like state structures that were uh, integrating these people and kind of like binding them together. Uh, so that kind of society, you know, that takes off in Europe. Um, everything is like thriving. And, uh, you know, it's not until like 3600 BC, and that's when there actually is a climate downturn. Uh, and kind of like the old Europe, uh, you know, the hunter-gatherer farmer synthesis starts to decline, population falls. Um, and finally, you know, it's just kind of like someone was going to shake things up and that someone just happened to be the uh, Indo-Europeans who had taken up um, kind of cattle pastoralism, you know, they're milking their cows, they figured out how to uh, ride horses. Uh, although mostly I think it was, you know, kind of horse driven carts were, uh, you know, providing them the logistics for long distance military campaigns. Um, senior Europeans, they go in, they like totally wipe out certain groups like, uh, you know, the funnel beakers were basically annihilated as were uh, the Cucatini Trapillion people. Uh, you know, but some people, you know, kind of like the Spanish um, integrated like the Tlaxcala, uh, you know, when they conquered Mexico and, you know, they formed the Mexicans, uh, you know, it looks like it was similar for the Indo-Europeans with the uh, kind of early European farmer, uh, Western hunter-gatherer like synthesis, um, you know, the globular M4 cultures. So they mixed with them, they formed like this new uh, synthesis, the accorded wear culture. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, one part of the big uh you know, change around 3000 BC. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Like you see the rise of Egypt, you see, uh, you know, in this valley civilization starts to become uh, like a lot more integrated in the world sphere. You've got like the sail, the wheel that are uh, going around everywhere. Um, you see like the Minoans, they launched like this massive invasion of Greece, uh, presumably from kind of like the Northern uh, coast of Anatolia, which is shielded from, you know, kind of central Anatolia by, uh, you know, the various mountains there. Uh, so that kind of ushers in the Bronze Age. There's this new, like, global structure, uh, presumably mediated by, like, the Indo-Europeans controlling, like, these trans, uh, you know, step trade routes. Uh, and that goes on for a couple hundred years. There's a big, uh, you know, the 2200 BC, that's another, you know, a lot of areas did collapse, but the Bronze Age, like, did endure it, even though it was definitely not a pleasant time. 
like the Indus Valley civilization had some issues, even though it didn't really collapse for another couple hundred years. Uh, down in like Karnataka, there's uh, you know evidence of like large scale like burnings of um, you know farmsteads that kind of thing, which might be the arrival of the Dravidians, um, you know, from the north. You know, I, I don't think the DNA has really illuminated that yet, um, or has it? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, we we can talk about that later, maybe, maybe. But uh, really, like, there's no DNA right now that's published. Um, I mean, I guess I'll just say it. Like, it looks like people in India are just sitting on ancient DNA. I don't know what's going on. There's a lot of a uh, lot of Sherman. You know, there's a lot of anger right now. So in the online community, you probably heard a little bit of it. Well, um, you know, because the other interesting thing too, you know, I was focusing more on like Western Eurasia because I don't know like nearly enough to judge on Eastern Eurasia, uh, but I guess there were like some, you know, signs of like rice-based civilizations kind of like more in the Ganges Delta area. Uh, you know, they were rice-based rather than wheat-based, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm kind of interested to see like what kind of, you know, genetic impact those guys had too. You know, I think yeah, that would have been, yeah, no. that would have been like long before the Munda arrived, I think, right? Yes. Uh, so the Munda, just uh, for the listeners, Austroasiatic people and uh, their language is Austroasiatic. They're about like 20, 25% East Asian. It looks Southeast Asian, Austroasiatic. And it's all paternal, like there's almost no East Asian mitochondrial DNA, but like something like 60% is East Asian, Y chromosomal. And uh, basically, if it is true that agriculture came to Southeast Asia after 4000 BC, by definition, or 4, 2000 BC, so 4000 years ago, by definition, the moon and a half to postdate that. Although it could be a little earlier in some areas, there's some finds in Myanmar that suggest that maybe there was more early intrusion and that the location in Vietnam and northern Vietnam that dates to there's a there's a site in northern Vietnam where Australo Melanesia basically uh, just, you know, hunter gatherer forager people are buried with farmer people from north from China dates to 2000 BC. And so that's usually the peg for when agriculture started spreading. But there's a site in Myanmar, which is like 100 or 200 years later, but it looks just mixed in a way that indicates that they were there for a while. So it could be a little earlier, but overall, yes, the Munda are pretty late arrivers uh, to the subcontinent, definitely after the coalescence of the Indus Valley civilization people. Okay. Um, so the 2200 BC, that was like, you know, it was a pretty major collapse, but it didn't end the, uh, the bronze age, um, that had to wait until like the bronze age is the fifth age, by the way, that's like 3000 BC to uh, 800 BC by my, uh, you know, crude, um, you know, chronology, uh, bronze age collapse, you know, absolute catastrophe, you know, have all these droughts in like the middle East and East Africa. And, uh, you know, so people are starving, you know, the kings, lords, high priests, whatever, they can't, um, you know, do their gift exchange and stuff that maintains their, uh, you know, kind of their social framework and legitimacy. So there's just like widespread, um, you know, collapse everywhere. And I think it brought down, you know, like everyone focuses on the Eastern Mediterranean since that's the area that's the best studied. And we actually have like records of it. Um, you know, like some of the stuff in the Bible, I think happened in like during the bronze age collapse, like Solomon and David, um, you know, that whole thing I think was maybe like 1050 BC, uh, to my understanding. I know the biblical Institute of Jerusalem guys do a lot of that research. Um, you know, so a lot of terrible stuff happens and, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's a recent, I think the, only the preprints out, it should be published in the next couple of months, but, uh, hepatitis strains actually like largely die off uh, during the Bronze Age collapse, which just gives some idea of like how far international contacts uh, fell in that period. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of just like absolutely massive population turnover, you know, in Britain, for instance, where like the Celts replaced half the population, um, you know, a lot of stuff going on in India as well. I think that's when like the gray painted ware uh, people are spreading, uh, who are mostly Aryans to my uh, understanding. Uh, the Iranians, you know, they sweep into Iran, 
Um, you know, there's parts like the Don River where people just like forget, you know, they lose access to metal and, um, you know, they just go back to like stone and bone tools, basically. Like literally they go back to the Stone Age just because the uh, collapse uh, falls that far. And then you also have the Uralic peoples, you know, the ancestors, the Finns, the Udmorts, the Mari, the Estonians. Uh, you know, they go and uh, they still have like access to all this bronze metal, unlike everyone else whose, you know, trade networks are breaking down. So they go and they conquer like all of Russia north of the forest line and cross into like Estonia, the Baltic, Finland. And, you know, it's kind of like these war bands of uh, or like chieftains who set themselves up as the new rulers. Um, I don't think there was that much female migration. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a different story because it looks like there were like several different migrations, like the one that produced the Udmurts and the Komi went like via the north and the Pechora, whereas the other ones like, you know, probably went further south. Uh, so that's the Bronze Age collapse. Um, and one part of the world that actually kind of like endured the Bronze Age collapse was the, uh, the South Caucasus, uh, which had experienced kind of like its own localized collapse around 1500 BC, uh, possibly due to you know, and this is just like wild speculation due to kind of the, Indo, you know, the Iranians, the Aryans in Central Asia, you know, they took over, you know, the copper and like tin trade routes to uh, Central Asia and like those markets for the, uh, you know, wealthy civilizations of Mesopotamia. Um, so, you know, the, you know, kind of South Caucasus peoples, they were like pushed to the periphery um, by this like takeover, you know, by all those changes going on in Central Asia. Uh, so they actually had these early experiments with uh, iron working with the iron bloomeries in the South Caucasus. And, uh, you know, iron working kind of like spreads out from the South Caucasus, you know, gradually goes into like Europe, the Middle East, Africa. Uh, India was a little bit different. Um, you know, was, uh, I'm going to mispronounce it. It's like Chachaskar, uh, but kind of like the, you know, very remote area even today in India, to my understanding, but there's kind of the innovators of uh, iron metallurgy in India, you know, so it kind of like diffuses from that part. So it's kind of like these very peripheral peoples, uh, you know, whether it's the Uralix with their bronze metallurgy and like the Altai, it was, you know, the uh, called Chian civilization and the West Cox, you know, Southwest Caucasus, uh, as well as these people in Chitaskar who are like spreading metallurgy um you know around the world uh right at the end of the you know bronze age collapse which was the uh you know the fifth fall fifth collapse in a uh, my chronology um and i think you know again this is just like total speculation there's the whole like prometheus myth where uh, he's on mount elbrus and uh what's nowadays i think it's in russia maybe it's in georgia um you know but he's kind of like you know, uh, he's the one that gives like fire to the Greeks. And I kind of wonder if that's like a dim memory of like these Caucasian uh, people like spreading, you know, technology and knowledge back to all of these people who had, a uh, you know, collapsed during the Bronze Age. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not, uh, you know, again, just total speculation. So the sixth age, which is roughly like 800 BC to 880, you know, the Iron Age, the Classical Age, later parts, late antiquity, you know, Romans, the Persians, um, you know, the Mauryans, the Guptas, uh, you know, everyone's pretty familiar with it. Uh, very different like social structure because of the way that iron changes things. Uh, you know, tin, you know, so for bronze, you need like copper and tin. And even though everywhere has copper, uh, tin is pretty rare. And, you know, the competition for these tin sources drove a lot of uh, stuff, uh, you know, possibly Celtic invasion of Britain, possibly, you know, the uh, Iranian Aryan conquest of like uh, Central Asia. Uh, iron, though, you know, a lot more common. Uh, it takes more like capital investment just to get, you know, to make like bloomeries and stuff than it does to make bronze. Uh, but at the same time, like since iron is more like available, it favors the creation of like these large infantry armies rather than having like these small war bands of like guys who just take over on chariots or uh, whatever with their bronze arms and armor. Instead, you know, uh, everything kind of changed to you know, how does a state mobilize like as many men as it possibly can to, uh, you know, uh, be armed by its, you know, with arm, with, uh, you know, iron weapons. So, you know, whereas everything was kind of like totally shattered in 800 BC, there's this definite trend towards consolidation, uh, you know, in India, the Middle East, and in, uh, you know, Europe too. Where, you know, that's why you get like the Romans, they start off as this uh, kind of like tribe. And, you know, then the Persians, they start off as like 
or I guess the Persian, or the, the better way to be to describe it would be, you know, the Romans started off as kind of like the keystone ally and like this alliance network of Italic peoples. And they, you know, became powerful, not through getting like the wealth, you know, collecting taxes and tributes from their neighbors, but by, you know, getting soldiers, uh, you know, as part of their like alliance structure. So they had to like, you know, as conquer or die for them. If they didn't, if they weren't at war and they very rarely were not at war, then, uh, you know, their allies would, you know, their allies had their own political systems, their own um, customs, their own languages in a lot of cases, uh, really into like the first century in the aftermath of uh, the social war when everything, you know, when a lot of those peoples got taken in as like Roman citizens and stuff. So they always had to be at war. They always had to get like more and more plunder to uh, pay off their allies with. And they just kind of like, you know, snowballed and took over everyone else. In Greece, it was a lot different. They had the alliance structures, but like, um, you know, you've got, uh, what was it? The Pel- there was the Peloponnesian League with Sparta, right? And then it was the um, yes. Del- Delian League was Athens. Yes, the Delian League was Athens. And they went, you know, at least the Athenians, you know, they, you know, they took tribute rather than, I mean, they did require like, you know, soldier and naval contributions from uh, their allies and the people in Delian League. But, you know, a lot of it was tribute, which made, you know, a lot of those people uh, understandably unhappy with Athens. So rather than seeing like this trend towards militarization, like you do, um, you know, in Rome, where, you know, by like the Punic Wars, the Romans were able to, you know, come back from even catastrophes like uh, Cannae and like raise new armies. Um, I think, what was it, like 10% of Roman men or like 15% of Roman men were killed at Cannae or something. Um, yeah. You know, just like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was like Turkey in World War One or like Russia in World War Two, as far as, uh, you know, percentage death toll. Uh, but they, they, could, they could come back just like the, uh, you know, Soviet communism or, uh, you know, the Turkish uh, nationalists under Ataturk did just by like this tremendous uh, mobilization, um, you know, just because that was their whole social structure was built towards, uh, you know, mass mobilization for these like iron bearing warriors. Uh, the Greeks, meanwhile, you know, they were more big on like wealth, trade. Um, they're probably smarter than the Romans, honestly. I think uh, there's like that British team, you know, they're doing the polygenic scores for the ancient samples they found, you know there's like a positive correlation between the caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry and the intelligence at least for the old world guys um i'm not sure what happened with that project i haven't seen them like put anything out but i believe it uh the greeks definitely uh were advanced a lot more than uh, a lot of their neighbors were uh so you know wealth kind of capital investment technology that made sense uh further to the east you have kind of the drives in Iran, you know, it's much closer to the steppe in Central Asia. You have kind of these uh, horse riding warriors that are roaming around. Uh, So you have kind of a different social structure where you're trying to get these like roving bands of, uh, you know, nomadic or semi-nomadic like cattle pastoralists to uh, support your army. And that, you know, it's it's a lot more complicated than that, of course, because obviously there are a lot of like sedentary peoples involved in the uh, the Persian empire. but it was a different style of uh, militarization that was based on like clan align- alignments and stuff. Uh, you know, and then meanwhile in India, you know, I'm not as familiar with that, but, you know, I think the popul- part of it was the population in India and the Indus Valley is just so much larger than it was in uh, Europe or the Middle East. So you have like these class divides, which were even more extreme and you get like the Nandas who are kind of like a, I don't know, like a bourgeois revolutionary is that's probably pretty an anachronistic an anachronistic uh, description, but, you know, so there's different processes uh, going on in India too. But anyhow, like it's all like the general tendencies with iron were towards more mobilization of resources towards uh, political consolidation. Um, So that kind of goes all the way up until kind of like the third to seventh centuries AD, uh, once kind of the limits of those, uh, you know, the legacies of that era of mass mobilization kind of um, start to fail. Like in Iran, you have, uh, you know, when the like Persian rulers were trying to assert their authority, they didn't want to be undermined by like the powerful Zoroastrian priestly caste. Uh, so they kind of like restricted the power of the priests. And the, as a result, the priests became like more state-based, like the Russian Orthodox Church did. It wasn't that integrated with the people. So when the state fell, so did the religion, you know, with Alexander and everything. Uh, 
and outside of places like Cappadocia and Armenia, um, which you know did rise again. Uh, you know, it wasn't until like the rise of the Parthians and uh, eventually the, Sassan the Sassanids uh, that kind of Zoroastrianism was revived. Um, meanwhile, the Roman Empire, like Roman paganism, kind of, you know, it, was, it worked very well, like integrated a lot of different beliefs uh, with, I, I guess there were like the Jews and the Druids were kind of the two big groups that caused a lot of religious issues for the Romans. But largely, uh, you know, people were fine with their gods being integrated into like this uh, Roman pagan system. Um, but, uh, even that had its, uh, limits once, I mean, there's just, I mean, the fall of Rome has been done at a, I don't need to go over that again. So, uh, you know, all these societies have their limits. There's all these catastrophes. You've got the Huns that, uh, I think the Huns that invaded the, um, India in the sixth century were Iranian, not Turkic, right? Even though they had the same yeah, name. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe they were not Turkic. They were... They're the white Huns or the Hephthalites, but yeah, uh, Hun is a little bit of a generic, became kind of a generic term. So you've got them, you know, they're devastating these kind of uh, largely settled societies. And then um, eventually you have kind of the rise of, uh, you know, in Europe, you have Christianity and, uh, you know, in the Middle East, you have uh, Islam. So the... Uh, Sixth fall, fall of the Roman empires, the Huns, the Avars, uh, you know, the white Huns, um, you know, the Arabs, the Berbers, the Slavs, you know, they're all uh, overthrowing civilization and everything becomes fragmented again. Uh, the seventh age, um, you know, you have like these parallel power structures uh, with, you know, the Christian churches in the West, and then you have, um, so even if like a state fell in the West, like the Catholic church was still there, to, you know, with uh, its tithes, its lands, its monks, you know, and it still had like a lot of legitimacy and something could be restored uh, from the ruins. Um, the Middle East, you know, was different. You had like a unified caliphate fairly, you know, very, I mean, from the beginning, actually, uh, except it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a total state. It was, uh, you know, you always had a bunch of different tribes under the caliphates. They're always maneuvering against each other. Uh, so there's always opportunities for groups to embrace stuff like the Abbasid movement or, you know, Shiaism, um, you know, that wanted to kind of restore the true Islam. And then, uh, you know, once Islam, as Islam spread, it's most like, uh, you know, it's best spreading variants, you know, went further and further to like Malaysia, where they, you know, spread the alphabet, became huge cultural parts. You had the Sufi mystics in India. Uh, which provided like an alternative form of legitimacy to kind of like secular uh, kinghood. Um, so you have like these kind of parallel power structures uh, that develop in the Middle Ages that kind of like bring order, learning, and civilization to these like otherwise barbarian warlords. And uh, that's where, you know, I think it's like right around the 13th century that Islam and, um, you know, Christianity diverge. Uh, and I think a lot of it had to do less with the philosophical precepts of Islam and Christianity. And I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me uh, on that. And I think a lot more of it had to do with hydrology. Uh, you know, the Middle East, unfortunately, you know, for better or for worse, has, uh, you know, a limited number of navigable rivers. There's places like Anatolia and Iran, especially, which are like, kind of like the bases of the main empires. And, uh, you know, they're notorious for being mountainous and having a lot of uh, non-navigable rivers. Uh, meanwhile, Europe, you've got the Rhine, you've got the Danube, you've got, like, I think Britain has the highest density of navigable rivers in the entire world, um, at least in Eurasia. So, uh, you know, there's all these opportunities for capital investment and water mills. And, uh, you know, so, so in the 13th century, you see, like, all these water mills that are developing all over Europe. So rather than, um, you know, the past, which had been based on, like, uh, you know, animal power, you know, the future was water power. Like it was all capital investment. It was engineering. It was learning. That was, you know, kind of setting the West on its, uh, you know, its path. Whereas, you know, the Middle East, it was, you know, it was still progressing. There were still a lot of advances in technology and science, society, uh, religion, everything else too. Uh, it's just they lacked that, you know, that class of engineers didn't develop as much as it did um, in Europe. And to the extent it did, it was like very heavily taxed and like oppressed, like uh, Nader Shah, for instance, in the 18th century, you know, he was like depopulating his cities, not by, um, 
you know, by killing them, which I mean, he did, I guess. But a lot of it was just he taxed people so much that they went and like became, uh, you know, roving nomads. They went and, you know, herded their sheep or cattle where his, uh, you know, soldiers couldn't tax them as easily as they could in the cities. So that kind of like, you know, took uh, Europe and uh, the Middle East in two different paths. Um, Reformation in uh, Europe is kind of contemporaneous with like the Shia revival in Iran, uh, which I've been kind of interested that they happened both at the same time, and yet their structures were like very, very different. Like, you know, the Shia revival was done by the, you know, fanatical Turkmen warrior bands of the Safavid order, you know, that wanted to spread the Shia revolution, you know, from uh, the Mediterranean to, uh, you know, the Hindu Kush, uh, you know, which they're somewhat successful in. Um, and then, you know, even though like the Ottomans had heterodox origins, they, you know, eventually that became the caliphs in 1517 and kind of took the mantle of uh, orthodox sunni islam um you know meanwhile you know but there's still like you know the base for both of them was these kind of like semi-nomadic uh, pastoral nomads in anatolia and iran uh, meanwhile in europe you had like these uh, guys who were you know it's the polemicists the guys who were like making the most outrageous claims uh, in the printing presses who could get the most, um, you know, distribution for their views, get the support from the princes uh, who are kind of driving like this trend that lasted for about five centuries, like all the way up until uh, 1945, uh, where you have like increased mobilization of the population through education, through military mobilization, through, you know, capital investment in a lot of places. Uh, so there's like this general increase in state capacity and political consolidation uh, all the way up until 1945, you know, and that's kind of the path that the West goes. I um, that kind of ends with, you know, you have liberal democracy. I, mean, I guess there's like the American Revolution was kind of a push back against that, but you know, that's beyond, uh, you know, the topic of this um, conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so you hit a lot of um, you hit a lot of points, and. Uh... I want to go back and dig into some of these if you are okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and just to be clear uh, for the the listeners, viewers, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is from your, your Substack. I mean that this narrative, uh, nemets.substack.com, N-E-M-E-T-S.substack.com. Just the spelling for those of you who want to know, it's uh, seven ages of Western Eurasia. So you start, 11,700 years ago, but you allude to things earlier. So there was an Emian, which is, I think, 115,000 years ago, and then around there, you know, the interglacial, it was super hot. Uh, the, the fact that I always remember about the Emian is there were hippos in southern England, and agriculture did not happen that we know of then, <laughs> but you allude to, uh, you allude to, like, a few kind of attempts at civilization, and so... Uh, I I want to be clear here because I think we both agree, um, but you know some of the people out there might not know or they might have different views. Uh, you know, civilization, old school way to define civilization is there's got to be writing, you got to have history, et cetera, et cetera. I don't define it that way anymore because when you look at the Kukateni, Tripolia civilization, uh, with what they did, ironworking or not ironworking, um. Gold, gold working in the Varna, which is in Bulgaria earlier, like 5,000 BC or something. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on that are uh, pre-literate, um, that are pretty advanced. And it's not just all in the Middle East. Yes, the Middle East, you know, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big coincidence. Or um, it's interesting that the Middle East hit writing first, had lit, which is a big deal. And it probably hit agriculture first, even though it hit agricultural rose independently elsewhere it probably was the first place that it really spread a lot so those two things i think have skewed our perspective because between those two events a lot other parts of the world did a lot of things so for example you know domestication of horses it's kind of a big deal almost certainly uh it happened multiple times in the eurasian steppe and then it spread to the rest of the world as i said like you know working in gold well i mean that that ha seems to have happened in bulgaria um, you know, things like this. Um, and so civilization, we use a bigger category. Um, I think of it as more, you know, like specialization um, beyond just like everyone is a primary producer, everyone's a farmer, 
You have some level of hierarchy. You have surplus that's sequestered by an elite, and they engage in luxury good production, et cetera, et cetera. I think civilization's a little bit, you know, I'm not going to say what it's referencing, but it's like you know it when you see it uh, type of thing. We can enumerate it, but everyone kind of knows. Okay. So you allude to, uh, you know, I think you allude, you talk about Gobeli Tepe like explicitly, and I have done. I did a podcast with Sam Borja. You linked to his piece in Palladium, great magazine, by the way. Everyone should check out Palladium. Um, in any case, um, you know, it's it's definitely a pre-agricultural site as we understand it. And then you talked about a Paleolithic village in Israel and an underwater megalith off the coast of Sicily. Um, I did not, uh, I did not like check the Sicily one in too much detail, but I did look at the Israel one and that looks pretty interesting. You know, uh, Peter, you really, really read a lot of archeology span and, um, obviously you have uh, mastery of, you know, some of these facts. Um, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Like, let's talk about the Israeli village, talk about the Sicily thing. Um, let's talk about your, your perspective as someone who reads the literature, uh, on what was going on in the Ice Age. So I think, um, you know, Samo had his book, and then I think David Graeber and what's his name's, uh, uh, their book, The Dawn of Everything, kind of had some stuff like this, although, like, I'm not going to lie, I haven't read it because I saw some really negative reviews from people I really respect. Uh, but, um, you know, there's this idea that Ice Age humans, place to see late Upper Paleolithic, late Pleistocene humans uh, after 40,000 years ago when it's just us, mostly. Um, there could be a few relic populations here and there of other types of human lineages. Um, I do take some objection to you calling uh, other hominids non-human, but we don't need to get into that. Um, I think humans should be a big category. And some people should just a little category. But in any case, um, let's talk about these Ice Age uh, proto-civilizations, incipient false starts. Uh, like, uh, tell us about it, because I'm, I'm fascinated uh, this sort of stuff. I mean, I'm not going to go Graham. Ham, Ham, I'm not going Graham. Graham Ham, Graham Hancock. But like, talk about it. Sure. Um, I mean, the most unambiguous one is the one in uh, Israel. You know, I think it's like 22,000 BC, I believe. And uh, you know, there's signs of intensive kind of cultivation, uh, or at least harvesting of uh, cereal grains and kind of like processing those. Um, so in the southern Levant, which seems to be an area which is like uniquely protected from, you know, climate downturns, uh, you know, it's, it's a warm area. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, it does go back quite, you know, I think there's probably stuff earlier than that specific site. Uh, I think part of the problem, too, is that since sea levels were so much lower, you know, people were, you know, like estuaries are very nutritionally rich. Uh, so a lot of these old, like, civilized sites where you have, you know, specialization, you know, agriculture, or at least intensive cultivation of cereals, uh, you know, are underwater. Um, I think the Levant would be, like, the best place to, uh, you know, off the coast of Israel, coast of Lebanon, um, would be the best place to uh, look for that. Maybe off the uh, kind of, because I think a lot of, um, you know, there's a theory called Euphradian. Uh, you know, a linguist friend like totally dismisses it, uh, but he thinks there's actually a substrate uh, in Sumerian of a population that lived in, you know, the lands that are now like drowned underneath the Persian Gulf, uh, just off the coast of Iraq. Uh, you know, I think that's another good place to look since you've got like the Tigris and the Euphrates, they would have been like draining into, uh, you know, the much smaller Persian Gulf back then. Uh, and it would have been like a very nutrient uh, and fish rich area. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be agricultural. I think there is a uh, pos. I think a lot of these kind of like civilized societies in the Ice Age would have been more like the Calusa or the Pacific Northwest uh, Amerindians, where they would have been like intensive. Uh, you know, they would have been like stratified. They would have had specialization, but they would have been still based on like hunting and gathering, and particularly fishing, since fishing is a very uh, yeah. you know wealthy source of nutrients. Yeah. But there were some like the one in the Southern Levant, which I think were kind of like a sign of um, you know agriculture or uh, you know intensive cultivation of uh, wild cereals. Uh, the issue, though, with detecting these two is one like a lot of the sites would be underwater and then two is that the traits that we want like the non-shattering uh, ratchets on uh, cereal grains is that those are intensively disfavored by you know natural selection in nature uh, you know grain that doesn't shatter naturally is not going to spread its seeds and it's just not going to go very far it's something that has to be selected for by humans so uh 
you know, maybe, you know, genetics much better than I do. You know, maybe there's some way genetically we could see previous signs of domestication for now wild plants, uh, you know, but it's not going to show up just by looking at their phenotypes. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to look at bottlenecks and things like that, like long term, long term variation in affected population size. Uh, you should be able to see signatures of that. Uh, so domestication tends to cause bottlenecks because when you're doing selection, you're reducing the sample size uh, any given generation. Uh, so you see massive, massive bottlenecks in domestic lineages of, of cattle and obviously dogs and other sorts of animals, right? Um, some of them are not as bottleneck. Dogs, dogs seem to have evolved very slowly. I, I don't know. Basically, there are outbred, uh, non-creepily inbred dog lineages that are like really, really old. Uh, some of these uh, ancient breeds uh, that are around, uh, like the Basenji or something, but not just the Basenji, other types of dogs as well. Um, so that's what you would look at. Um, I, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. You're talking about the Calouse, uh, the Palouse, I think, um, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, it's the part of the country I'm from. And I'll just, uh, reiterate, I, you know, I actually talked to, a last year I had a podcast with Manvir, Dr. Manvir Singh, uh, about, um, foragers and hunter gatherers and how they were probably very different in the Pleistocene than, than we think of them. Actually, Pleistocene, early Holocene. Uh, because you can think of places like in Northern Europe on the North, you know, in the Baltic and on the North Sea, um, where hunter gatherers and foragers did quite well and had high population densities because there were a lot of calories there that they could access. So in the Pacific Northwest, we know exactly what they did and why they were so dense. There's these massive salmon runs and uh, a, a baby could go be a fisherman. Uh, they're just so dense. And it, I mean, you can see some of the old, uh, uh, the earliest films. I mean, there are silent films. Uh, that show these uh, people, or at least what was left of them, uh, fishing. And it was just crazy how easy it was uh, to get calories out of, uh, you know, the rivers as the salmon are swarming and coming up. There are other situations like that. I mean, there's salmon in the Atlantic. Uh, there's other situations that are like that. And we don't see them in the old world because agriculture kind of eliminated those foragers, but they're around for a while. And so if you have a high enough forager density, you could imagine that they could do hierarchy, uh, primary production, beyond primary production to surplus. Um, this is what we see in the Pacific Northwest tribes. They are basically hunter-gatherers. They're hunters. Uh, they're not necessarily super mobile, but they're foraging in the local area, and they have stratification. They have slavery. They're very warlike. And you know this is the culture of potlatches, where very, very wealthy people engage in conspicuous conspicuous consumption and also conspicuous generosity uh, to establish their status. So these are obviously complex societies uh, that are not dependent on agriculture. So yes, that can happen. Um, it's interesting to me that Israel is so important. Obviously, many of the listeners and viewers are going to be uh, you know, believers that Israel is very important religiously uh, in the origin of the human species. And what you're saying is it sounds like Israel is kind of at this equipoise uh, at this perfect, perfect median uh, between uh, the north and the south. Uh, we know evolutionarily this is as far north as some early modern human lineages got uh, before the explosion of the uh, uh, upper Paleolithic or like uh, lithic technology um, around 60,000 years ago that swept across the world. Um, as far south, northern Israel is probably as far south as Neanderthals got. Um, so, you know, our cousins got, got down there too. And of course, there's a new species, supposedly, uh, probably it's a form of Neanderthal, if I'm going to be honest, um, that was discovered a couple of years ago by Israeli archaeologists. Uh, Israel really invests in this field and, you know, more power to them. Um, so that, that, that was definitely interesting to me. Um, I guess, like, you know, uh, okay, so these Ice Age Pleistocene civilizations, uh, you know, they were humans like us, they had the same impulses, but they didn't scale. We never did anything during the Emian, so we just didn't have our stuff together. Okay, um, now we move into the Holocene, and it seems like you know you're describing all these collapses and and stuff like that. Um, are you simplifying the cycles? Because I don't know the archaeology as well as you, but you know, like exa resource exhaustion, collapse. I like, mean, were there littler cycles in there that you didn't mention in your piece? Yeah, I mean, the whole piece is definitely, a, you know, it's an outline, it's a simplification, and I'm just trying to, uh, you know, show people the broader trends. Uh, like the 2200 BC collapse was definitely like a major 
you know, huge, you know, catastrophic event. Um, you know, it, it didn't end the Bronze Age, though, and I don't think it was on the scale as like some of these other collapses, though, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, similarly, there's some parts like the 4400 BC collapse, you know, it definitely happened in Europe. Um, but at the same time, like Europe actually thrived after the collapse, like it was, uh, you know, the resulting synthesis clearly was beneficial to, you yeah, know, in yeah. the long run. Well, I want to ask you about this because, like, people, this is the hunter gatherer resurgence, the forager resurgence. Talk about it a little. Talk about that part because that's really interesting, I think, to a lot of people, and we can like explore it a little bit. I think the hunter gatherer resurgence is something that you know the forty four hundred BC one is the one that's best known since Europe has you know a lot of resolution as far as uh, you know ancient DNA. There's tons of archaeological work, uh, but I think it is like a broader historical. Uh, you know, it happens a bunch of times in a bunch of different places. Like, you know, it happened in Japan where, you know, the old, like, Y haplogroup D carrying Jomon, you know, they get overrun like twice in a couple hundred years. And yet something like a third of Japanese men carry their, uh, you know, direct male line descendants from them. They carry that Y haplogroup D. Uh, there's something similar in Tibet where, uh, I, I really need to read that new Tibetan DNA paper, but I think there's like two waves of farmers. But yet, yeah. you know, most Tibetan men still carry a, is it a majority or it's at least a significant minority still it, carry it, the haplogroup D? Yeah, so, so haplogroup D, just for the listeners and viewers out there that are, like, unfortunately not nerdy enough to know this, haplogroup D is found in three places. Japan, uh, Tibet, the Andaman Islands. So there's definitely, like, something that's going on, though, where, you know, these peripheral peoples, um, whether it's because they have access to metal mines, whether it's because they're, like, these high Asabia groups in the mountains uh, that are just healthier than, you know, they're, they've got, like, access to meats from goats or whatever, uh, versus, like, the very uh, malnourished, uh, you know, kind of farmer people with the lowlands. Uh, you know, maybe they like repeatedly take them over. They can install themselves as like a ruling class, being like stronger and more warlike. Uh, and that's a pattern that repeats in a lot of different places. Um, I think it happened in Cameroon uh, too, where you have like certain groups that are, you know, overwhelmingly Bantu in ancestry, but that they have this extremely rare like A00 haplogroup that split off like 200,000 years ago. Um, you know, so there's, and even in the American Southwest, for instance, you have kind of these like marginal desert peoples that overran the uh, kind of civilized peoples uh, around like 1350 to, um, you know, 1450. Now, I mean, some of those peoples were, uh, you know, like totally foreign. They were uh, like the ancestors of the Apache and the Navajo who were coming all the way from like Northern Canada. Uh, but some of them were like local desert like uh, people that just uh, rose up and took over these uh, kind of civilized farming, uh, agricultural people with irrigation and, you know, astronomy. Um, in Europe, I think, you know, it's probably something pretty similar. Uh, the height, like the, uh, the height overlap is, or the height differences between the Western hunter-gatherers and their like early European farmer neighbors in the fifth millennium BC are pretty extreme. Like uh, there's a lot of, there were actually samples that people believed were actually men um, you know, from the, uh, Western hunter gather, from the, uh, uh, early European farmers that actually turned out to be Western hunter gatherer women, uh, just because of like how much healthier the uh, hunter gatherer lifestyle was from that, mm. uh, you know, very narrow lowest soil, uh, farming society. Uh, once the farmers had kind of hit their, you know, ecological limit, um, I think the trigger, though, like, I, I don't think it's coincidence at all. It's like one century you have, you know, all these mine, copper mines in, uh, you know, the Carpathians, like Austria and Hungary open up. And then the next century you have like this massive, like, overthrow of this kind of like network of societies by these people who were living right where these hunter gatherers were. So I think something about the spread of metallurgy changed the relationship of the hunter gatherers to the farmers. And that's why the overthrow happened. Um, Cause also interestingly too, is the trade networks with uh, you know, the South Caucasus don't break off. Like there's still the uh, trade going on from like the Carpathians to uh, you know, the South Caucasus. So, you know, it was definitely like a fall and, 
you know, it was like this age of revolution, I guess, more than a fall. So if you want to like critique the article, you could argue that like the 4400 uh, fall wasn't really a fall. It was more like this change and dramatic change in like social and uh, population relations. Yeah, and so I mean, your argument is, uh, from what I can take it, what what I can understand uh, is that there was a synthesis between these uh, mostly male. Um, so, so overall, in the genome of the farmers, the middle to the late Neolithic. So there's the early Neolithic, I guess maybe the middle of Neolithic as well, but really it's the transitions in the middle Neolithic to the late Neolithic. Uh, the the ancestry that's forager goes from say like five percent or something to fifteen to forty depending on where it's like forty in the northernmost funnel beakers in Sweden, and then you know it's closer to like fifteen in Sardinia and, and Spain or wherever where it's lower. But the key issue that you're pointing out is the Y chromosomal replacement. So all across northern Europe, um, we see uh, the displacement of G two. Uh, in particular, G haplogroup G uh, with haplogroup J or I two, so I two is the canonical Neolithic farmer uh, Y chromosomal lineage in Northern Europe. Actually, when the Indo Europeans show up, but that actually is originated in the foragers. I one and I two are both uh, basically Western hunter gatherers. Seem to have been almost all I. Eastern hunter gatherers somewhat different, more diverse, but we don't know as much about them in you know deep history. But um, so this was somehow uh, male mediated absorption, right? Yeah. And, you know, I don't think it was just Europe, too. I think there was something similar that happened in North Africa. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't, you know, that much North African DNA. We don't have a lot of like, you know, his prehistoric resolution and like the archaeology and everything. But they're uh, like the very... You know, you have the Ibero-Mauritians who are kind of like the indigenous uh, human lineage in like Northwest Africa. And then, um, you know, around, I think it's like 5200 BC, you start seeing like the cardio wear pottery stuff arrive in Morocco, except the uh, DNA that's associated with that cardio wear, like right at the end of the sixth millennium BC, which would have been, um, you know, I think that would have been the fourth age in my... Uh, Yes, or that would have been the the, uh, the third age. Sorry, uh, so you know, kind of the middle of the third age. Um, you know, and it's still like almost pure ibero mauritian and ancestry, and yet when you get to the samples from like the early uh, fourth millennium BC, uh, you know, it's actually a mixture, about an even mixture, like about half like ibero mauritian half uh, you know cardio wear, um, and specifically cardio wear not the like hunter-gatherer cardio wear synthesis that happened in Iberia after 4400 BC. So what I think happened is you have like, there's these ibero moroccan groups or, you know, Morocco Neolithic would be the more proper archeological term uh, that adopt like this cardio wear toolkit. Uh, the cardio wear people somehow push in in like the first couple centuries of the 4000s. And then, you know, there's a fusion of them that happened at some point be before 37 or uh, 3700 BC and that like fusion caused them um, you know to like totally change culturally one branch of them uh, you know there's the Tenerian culture which I'm really interested in and it's kind of like the northern part of like Chad and Niger uh, with like the Ayer mountains and everything uh, they do a bunch of like cattle burials and stuff very clearly uh, they're into like cattle pastoralism and um, I don't think we have any of the uh, we don't have any DNA of the Tenerians, actually, uh, but I think they're like the ancestors of the modern, of like in a large part of the uh, the Berbers and then also the uh, the Chadic peoples, because there's a Y chromosomal haplogroup that's originally found in the Western hunter gatherers that was picked up like very very early on in the Balkans by the early European farmers uh, R1B V88, and that's actually found uh, very early on in like the Cardio Ware settlement of Iberia, I think all the way in like 5800 BC in like the Pyrenees, um, and then it, it's most common today though not in Europe but in northern Nigeria, which is inhabited by the Hausa people. And the house of people, they speak a Chadic language. Chadic is an Afroasiatic language, or you know, Afroasiatic though, at least according to uh, two you know linguists that I trust, um, you know, they think it's nonsense, or it's a it's a, a result of language contact rather than a genetic family. And uh, 
you know, it's interesting in kind of like what's nowadays Northern Sudan. So kind of like the mid Nile region. Uh, there used to be like a west to east uh, tributary of the Nile called the Yellow Nile, which flowed in from uh, Chad into uh, Sudan. And it didn't dry up until the big like 2200 BC crisis. And there's some DNA uh, from right around that region uh, that's actually very closely related not to the people of Sudan, but to the people of Somalia. So I think that suggests that the ancestors of, you know, the Somalis, they're a Cushitic people, like a lot of the people in Ethiopia. So I think you have the Kushites, uh, you know, that are in Sudan. I think you have, there's the lighter band culture, which is in the Yellow Nile and has like a lot of the same cattle pastoral stuff as the Tenerians, even though its pottery is like very closely, you know, very much like locally derived. Uh, so I think you have like this Iberomorajan, um, Cardioware synthesis, uh, you know, that forms the Tenerians, branch of the Tenerians goes to the Yellow Nile, you know, and then, so that's like the ancestors of the Chadic peoples, you know, they eventually like migrate west into Nigeria. And then you have uh, the Egyptians who had moved to Egypt, I think, um, I think when was like first agriculture in Egypt, it was like 5,000 BC or 6,000 BC. Yeah, like it, I, it, yeah, it, I think it, I think it wasn't that early because the Green Sahara thing. How did the Green Sahara prevent agriculture from developing in Egypt? I think the issue is like uh, in terms of like resource constraint and stuff like that. Um, I, I because they weren't agriculturists, but they were uh, pastoralists, right? The Tenerians and the lighter band were, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because like, there's a lot of cattle in the Green Sahara and stuff, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the Fulani paper was really interesting, too, since the lack of, uh, or I think they're only Caucasian hunter-gatherer ancestry, which is like kind of a signal of Middle Eastern ancestry rather than like the Neolithic Europe ancestry, um, you know, is more recent. So I guess that suggests yeah. that, you know, the formation... You know, their Iberian Mirajan, Neolithic European ancestry, um, you know, is from like that much earlier migration yeah. and like the. Uh... Let, 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 yeah, let's give uh, let's give um, the the listeners and the viewers a little bit of context here. Um, there's a paper, a preprint. I think it's a preprint uh, uh, that came out, um, and uh, let me go. I think it's a preprint. I just I read it, so I, the whole genome. Yes, the preprint um, for the listener and the viewer to Google it. Echoes from the last Green Sahara whole genome analysis of Fulani, a key population to unveil the genetic history of Africa. So Fulani matter because, well, historically they matter because they're like pretty badass about like imposing a harsh version of Islam on everybody else. Like the Hausa were Islamicized to a great extent by the Fulani and the Sokoto Caliphate relatively late in the last couple hundred years. But earlier in history, um, you know, they're known as like traders, pastoralists on the southern side of the Sahara. They're not quite Taureg. Uh, they're not deep desert people. Um, their features tend to indicate uh, Eurasian affinity, so narrower nose, thinner lips. If you read some of Jeffrey Miller's early work, uh, Mating Mind, he talks about sexual selection possibly, but um, it's pretty clear. We know from the genetics, they have West Eurasian ancestry, uh, you know, like 15, 20%, not like overwhelming, but it's definitely detectable. And they have some other things like they have a European variant, Eurasian, let's say Eurasian variant of lactase persistence gene in their system. Um, that's a little weird. Uh, but um, if you look at their genetics, and I've like tried to analyze the Fulani before, actually, actually, like 20, 2010, uh, there were some, you know, simpler genotypes. And it was, <sighs> there's something up with them. We always knew that, yes, they're West Eurasian in origin. But it could not be well explained by contemporary samples, um, and it can't obviously be explained even by a lot of the ancient samples. But it turns out that they're probably the product of a very, very early exchange between people in Sub-Saharan Africa and Western Eurasia that moved into North Africa. They fused at the beginning of the Holocene, creating this like you know trans-Saharan culture. Uh, some of you guys have probably seen documentaries that show, you know, scenes in caves in the Sahara, but it's like savanna and there's giraffe and stuff like that. And they're drawing their cattle, 
you know, and so obviously the Sahara came, some of them went north, some of them went south. Um, the Fulani are admixed, but descended to, you know, non-trivial proportion from these people uh, who were probably mixed in some way originally, probably a higher proportion of West Eurasian originally. And um, I think the interesting thing is it shows that, uh, you know, exchanges between Sub-Saharan Africa and non-Sub-Saharan Africa happened very long time ago. There's a lot of arguments about how much happened during the Pleistocene. Uh, just so people know, during the Pleistocene, uh, Northern Africa, like the Maghreb, that area was actually like pretty good. Uh, you think about the climate bands and how they move. Uh, the temperate zone moves to the south, but overall the Sahara was way worse. Even than today, it was bigger. Um, the rainforest in the Congo was fragmented. A lot of it was savanna. And so it was probably a much bigger barrier during much of the upper Paleolithic. And then the Holocene shows up and we have this green Sahara phase when everything's much wetter, I think up until like 5,000 BC or so. And then, you know, uh, the rest is history, right? Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, that was a cool paper. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we've engaged in some, uh, there have been some peregrinations in this discussion, right? Which like, this is a feature and it's not a bug. Um, you know, you have references to a lot of archaeology here. Some of them I've read. Um, so I will say to the listener and the viewer, if you have not read The First Farmers of Europe, read it. Um, uh, it is by Stephen Shannon. Um, that's the only book of his I've ever read. Um, I think some of you have uh, known of or read, I mean, like, you know, former guest, um, hopefully future guest, uh, his book Dogs of War should be out maybe next year. Uh, David Anthony, Horse, Wheel, and Language is referenced. Um, and then uh, Escape from Rome, Walter Scheidel. I read that fall of 2020. It's a really great book. Um, I wish Scheidel was like a little less uh, uh, anti-classics, by the way. He's a little bit anti-classics, but whatever. I haven't read Iran of Modern History. Oh, wait, no, I have read it. That's a recent, it's a very recent book. I'm sorry, just all of these books on Iran are just like, Iran, a history, or Iran, a short history. It's like they're not very creative. Um, but the other books I have not read, and I just want to mention them, uh, Orcadia, Land, Sea, and Stone in Neolithic Orkney. I want to talk about Orkney in a second because it's kind of cool. Um, and then uh, Archaeology of South Asia from the Indus to Oshaka, Robin Conningham, and Ruth Young. Uh, and you guys can see all of these in, in Nemitz, uh, Peter Nemitz's post, Peter's post here. Um, and then, of course, Plagues and Peoples, William H. McNeil. I forgot that was at the top of it. Uh, everyone should read that book. Uh, William H. McNeil, one of my favorite, his late William H. McNeil, one of my fav late, favorite, late, uh, favorite historians, late, you know, he's, he died. Uh, read The Human Web. That's also a good book. He's got some other good books. Uh, just a great, great uh, macro historian. I have recommended him for years. And I mean, I've been reading him since I was a little kid, like literally, I was literally a child. Uh, he was such a big deal in the 20th century. So um, Orkneys, uh, let's talk about talk about the Orkneys because like, I think it's a cool story. I've never written on it and I haven't like talked about it, but there's been some papers that have come out recently. Um, the Orkneys are kind of, it's like, what if civilization like persisted in this little, so you didn't like come out and say it, I think in the piece, but I'll come out and say it. Uh, Indo-Europeans were like, I'm not going to swear because Apple, but um, they were effing barbarians. Uh, and, you know, I had um, JP Mallory on this podcast uh, years ago. Like some of you should look at the archives because I just looked uh, while, you know, I mean, I was paying attention, but um, I just looked at the podcast and I looked at the traffic and some of these old podcasts have not been trafficked very much. Uh, you guys don't know what gold is in there. Uh, do a little archaeology yourselves. So I have uh, interviews with David Anthony and J.P. Mallory, Thomas Olander, like, the, like let's call it the three Indo-Europeanists that I interviewed in the spring of 2021. Mallory said, you know, one reason we talk about Indo-European graves all the time is because that's all they can find. They didn't really live in villages initially. Uh, they seem to be nomadic, pastoralist, you know, agro-pastoralists. 
And, you know, there are all these, like, you know, the Kukatini Triplia civilization had these huge villages. They had this great, um, you know, pottery, beautiful pottery. Uh, the Neolithic megalith societies were creating these awesome megaliths, stuff like Newgrange. Um, and then these Indo-Europeans show up and they're like barbarians who are co-opting, reusing, uh, refurbishing uh, their previous civilizations of the Neolithic people. But they didn't get their crap together for like a long time until, you know, the Middle Bronze Age, maybe, maybe after 2000 BC in a lot of places uh, to start having larger settlements. So it took like a thousand years for civilization to really come back in Europe. Uh, and Orkney, though, is a very special place because it was like a time capsule uh, of a previous era in various ways. So talk about Orkney. I've been talking for a while. You you, you take, it, take it away, Peter. Sure. So, uh, you know, whatever, you know, so we talked about France earlier. For whatever reason, it looks like, you know, in the early uh, 3000s, uh, you know, after that kind of hunter-gatherer, early European farmer synthesis, um, you know, it looks like there was some sort of like French state or like states in France where, you know, people were mixing both from, you know, the Pyrenees to the Paris Basin. And, uh, you know, the samples that, you know, are published uh, from kind of like, you know, about the same time in Britain from the early, like, uh, you know, early European uh, farmer hunter-gatherer synthesis, like settlements in Britain, um, you know, I think they're like 4,000 BC, uh, 3,900 BC, you know, associated with the megalith uh, construction, because that's kind of the big, like, religious uh, cosmopolitan structure that's going on at the point. Uh, you know, they have, you know, very short runs on homozygosity. They're not inbred. Like, it was clearly, rather than being like a small group that was taking off in Britain, you know, there are clearly either multiple groups or, you know, an or what I think happened uh, without you know, that much evidence is that there was like an organized effort to colonize Britain, um, you know, whether for farmland or to exploit certain resources, I'm not sure. Uh, so they, you know, rapidly move, they take over Britain and Ireland, uh, looks like they mix in with the hunter-gatherers a bit, hunter-gatherer population probably wasn't that large, maybe a couple, you know, score thousand in the entire British Isles. Um, you know, there might've been some like local hunter-gatherer resurgences, uh, you know, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look like it was, you know, a campaign of annihilation. It looks like they were able to integrate the hunter-gatherers, you know, peacefully or not peacefully. Um, so, you know, about 3600 BC, there's not really like a collapse, but there's a def, you know, there's an increase in like uh, rainfall, increase in uh, kind of like colder climactic conditions, which affects, uh, you know, the whole world. Uh, the Green Sahara, of course, is afflicted too. Um, and, uh, you know, Britain, you see like a shift from wheat to barley from, you know, I think 3600 BC to 3400 BC. Uh, and there's kind of like a lot of signs that the population is declining. Uh, some areas, um, you know, it's mostly wheat to barley, like in the 3000s. Like by the time you get into the 2000s, you actually see like a shift from barley to hazelnuts. Like rather than, you know, cultivating... Um, you know, farmland, they've moved to just kind of like planting trees and, you know, praying, you know, because trees are very hard to cut down. You have to burn them to, uh, you know, destroy them. Uh, so there's definitely like a pretty dramatic fall in population in most of Britain and Ireland. There's a lot of signs of like cattle pastoralism, you know, so it was kind of like an era of the cattle raider. Uh, you know, these guys were just like running around. Uh, there are no horses. They were doing it on foot. Um, and there were exceptions like climactic conditions improved about 3200 bc to 3000 bc and that's when you kind of start to see like these huge tombs uh you know the infamous god king this guy was a product of first degree incest uh, about i think you know between 3200 and uh, 3000 bc in ireland you know absolutely massive tomb had you know astronomical significance and everything and, uh, you know, clearly took huge effort with like thousands and thousands of uh, workers involved in constructing these. But anyhow, like after, you know, in a century or two after his death, his kind of society starts to fall apart. Um, and after between like 3000 and 2500 BC, that's kind of like the last age of uh, Britain, you know, kind of that trend towards depopulation and shift away from agriculture towards pastoralism occurs everywhere except Orkney. So the Orkney Islands, there's these islands just off the northern coast of Scotland, and their population doesn't actually start to decline until like 2800 or 2700 BC. 
And, uh, you know, fairly early on, we see actually like the first uh, dated sites for what's called the grooved wear culture. They have these pots with grooves in them, so they call them the grooved wear culture, uh, are actually in the Orkney Islands. And, you know, they start to appear in like these coastal sites all over uh, the British Isles, then gradually like press inland. So what it looks like happened was these Orkney Island people, um, you know, they were like these sea pirates. They were the Vikings of uh, their time, possibly the first Vikings of the, uh, you know, the North Sea and the, uh, you know, Irish Sea. So it looks like they were going around, they were kind of reaving, um, you know, and that's why they were able, you know, they were presumably so successful that they were able to like raid crops and, uh, you know, bring them back to Orkneys that enabled their, you know, very poor, very cold, very remote island to uh, sustain itself, even in this uh, era of kind of declining crop yields and civilizational decline. Um, they were successful enough that, you know, when the Indo-Europeans show up, um, you know, so the Indo-Europeans, they, you know, initially they were like these hyper-violent uh, furries, you know, they had the choreos where they had like the dog uh, emblems, the wolf emblems, that kind of thing. You know, they just went out and, you know, wiped out whole, uh, you know, like campaigns of extermination, basically, for the funnel beakers and, uh, you know, the Kukutini Trapillians. Um, you know, they're kind of like mixed descendants with the Galapular Amphoras. They uh, picked up what's called the bell beaker culture, which is Bell Beaker is like a very loose uh, cultural assemblage, but it, you know, it did provide kind of like, you know, they did start to settle down somewhat, you know, grow more crops. They did have like settlements from the Bell Beaker influence. And they also learned how to sail. I mean, they, they had been able to sail boats uh, fairly early on, like when they launched their invasion of Scandinavia. Well, there's one theory that they uh, invaded Finland first by land and then Sweden second by sea. But, you know, I think there's some people that kind of push back on this. Uh, Christian Christensen would probably have a better uh, opinion than me. Uh, you know, but around like 2500, 2600 BC, uh, they had improved their boats and they started like contesting the sea routes around like the North Sea and, uh, you know, all the way to the Bay of Biscay, actually. There's a bell beaker find uh, near Bordeaux, actually, in kind of southwestern France uh, for, you know, one of these bell beakers around like 2550 BC, I think is the radiocarbon dating. I think it probably took place uh, a little bit later, you know, because there's like a range of a century or two for those. Um, so clearly like, you know, they're taking over like the old sea routes, uh, for the trade, you know, there's the whole Amber road, uh, which, you know, had gone on since I think kind of like the late, it really depends. Like, um, I know like the Getty museum, they've got like a nice discussion of it, uh, in some of their publications on whether or not certain finds are resin or Amber in pre-dynastic Egypt. Um, but, you know, there are suggestions that kind of the Amber Road, the shipping from the Amber from its like richest finds and what's nowadays like Russia, the Baltic, northern Poland, Denmark area, uh, all the way down to Egypt might date to before the Indo-European conquests. Uh, you know, so you have these guys that could, could have possibly been shipping this stuff all the way around the Baltic, through the North Sea, through Bay of Biscay, around Spain and the Mediterranean, uh, almost certainly indirectly, uh, but it was getting to Egypt. Um, so the Indo-Europeans, they began contesting this stuff in like the 26th to 25th centuries, and they launched this, uh, you know, part of this was a massive invasion of uh, the British Isles, you know, this absolutely like apocalyptic uh, invasion. They replaced like 90% of the, uh, you know, locals. And since, you know, the invading population was probably small, that means they probably killed a lot more than 90% of the original population, um, you know, before mixing with them. The exception, though, uh, last year, you know, there's some uh, DNA papers from, you know, kind of the Orkneys. It showed that, uh, you know, they had actually, their Y chromosomal lineage had actually survived. So what it looks like happened was the Orkney Islands, you know, in my opinion, probably my guess is due to their uh, considerable naval strength and naval heritage, uh, were able to actually like stave off this like, you know, genocidal series of invasions, of the British Isles. And even though over the course of like the Middle Bronze Age, they got absorbed into like the Indo-European world, with, like presumably through like bride exchanges or possibly through sex slavery, um, you know, maybe they were like, I would assume their old like sea reefing ways didn't uh, stop. You know, they would have just been taking like into your kind of the Indo-European women and like bringing them back to the Orkneys. 
uh, you know, there are why haplogroups like stay the same all the way to the end of the Bronze Age. Like I think there's a guy from like 1200 BC, right around the time of the Bronze Age collapse, and he still has that same uh, Western hunter-gatherer uh, Y chromosomal lineage that his like uh, you know ancestors had had going back um, you know 3,000 years to the hunter-gatherer surgeons. So they, you know, um, unlike the Sardinians who remained like just totally independent of the Indo-Europeans and like defied all attempts at Indo-European colonization. Uh, you know, they were forced into the Indo-European world, but they did it under their own terms. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about the Sardinians. Uh, did you mention the Neuragics in your piece? No, I didn't. Yeah, like let's not, like we've been talking for for a while, so I, you know, I, we need to like cut this off. Uh, but um Another case, another island, but uh, more isolated, is the Neuragics, and uh, they had, like, these big, weird megalith things and, like, these fortifications, and it looks like, uh, basically, they beat off the Bellbeakers and other types of Indo-Europeans, and, you know, into the Iron Age, uh, when the Phoenicians and the Etruscans and the, you know, Romans contacted them, like, the late, you know, post-Neuragic civilizations not Indo-European, um, so, and it, Paleo-Sardinian, which persisted into, uh, into, you know, late antiquity, uh, the, 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 the Latin speakers, the vulgar Latin speakers would say that these people uh, were just totally unintelligible, uh, and that basically means that they did not speak an Italic language, uh, which makes sense, that's far from Italy. Uh, they spoke a non-Indo-European language, it's Paleo-Sardinian, went extinct in like the sixth century or something, and uh, they, uh, you know, are probably the descendants of the Neuragics, uh, of the Neolithic Sardinians. And it's kind of like a Sardinia in the Iron Age was kind of like a what if alternate history. What if the Indo-Europeans had been like beat back or never shown up? And you see this totally weird alternative uh, society, uh, the Neuragics, uh, you know, during the Bronze Age, their ancestors had these weird horned. Like Dan Davies, uh, his YouTube show, which is really great, uh, he talks about like their weird horned helmets and stuff like that. Um, I do think most of the Sea Peoples were definitely Achaean, Greek, but there are some horned helmet individuals depicted in the Egyptian um, bas reliefs and in the, in the wall paintings. And I think that there is a high probability that they could have been Sardinians that somehow made it to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, you know, I, we don't have like a really good sense of how much people traveled, I think, in these ancient days, because it's not like there's that many, you know, shipwrecks and it's shipwrecks are hard to find and, and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, so I, I think that there was a little bit more, you know, I, you know, travel back and forth. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, um, we're hitting the 130 mark. Uh, you know, we need to close out here. Uh, so, Peter, uh, I'm going to ask you. Uh, you know, you did this survey uh, of Western Eurasia and archaeology. You did a lot of reading for it. Okay, what's the most surprising, interesting thing that you found? Um, I mean, I think definitely, like, the contact zone between Egyptian, Chaitic, and uh, Cushitic. That wasn't really discussed in the piece, but I kind of discussed it in my earlier uh, Sons of Chad piece. And just that whole kind of, like, you know, those two great journeys, whether it was you know, the, um, you know, the Kushites, who I think are like partially Natufian derived. And then you have, uh, you know, so it's kind of like the two, you have the Natufians in, in the Lev Southern Levant, and then you have the uh, Anatolian farmers who are kind of in, you know, just to the north of them. Um, you know, and they have these like two giant arcs, the Anatolians going counterclockwise through Europe, through Iberia, into, uh, you know, North Northwest Africa, then the Green Sahara. And then you have like these Natufians who go through like, uh, you know, going through Egypt into uh, Sudan and stuff. And then they like meet each other uh, right where the Yellow Nile and uh, the Nile kind of meet each other around like modern Dongola. And that's where you get, you know, the Egyptians, the Kushites and the uh, the Chadix are all meeting each other in the uh, fourth millennium. And that's uh, kind of the dawn of uh, at least, you know, the main branch of uh, what's known as Afro-Asiatic. Cool. Um, so... Yeah, uh, the Substack is nemets, N-E-M-E-T-S dot substack dot com. Uh, there's some other pieces. 
Um, I know that you're thinking about doing more of this, so hopefully you'll keep producing. Um, some of them are not as genetical. Uh, you have like a piece, The Roots of the Donbass Wars. Uh, that's very long. Uh, you know quite a bit about Eastern Europe, um, you know, and uh, you know, it shows <laughs> in the piece. A lot of maps. Uh, I think that readers will, uh, readers and uh, not listeners and viewers exclusively, because I know some of you prefer to consume um, in this medium, but readers will enjoy that piece. Uh, and there's there's some other ones that are interesting. Uh, you wrote uh, about uh, state versus national peoples, and you referenced uh, Dancing in the Glory of Monsters by Jason Stearns. I love that book. Uh, it was a great book. Uh, I think I read it like late, you know, read it when I was much younger. Let's just put it that way. Um, so yeah, uh, really enjoying your stuff. Thank you for coming on. And uh, I hope people learned a lot. Um, that was the point. Uh, there's a lot to learn out there. Uh, you don't need to be an academic. Uh, you could just be some guy out there like you, Peter, right? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, just... I read at breakfast, read at lunch, read at dinner. Um, you know, it's after uh, 20 years, it really adds up. Yeah, it's awesome, man. Really, really appreciate it. Um, enjoy your stuff. Uh, really recommend it. And thank you for your time, man. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on, Razib, and hope you have a good rest of your evening. This podcast for kids. <laughs>